Hello there, and welcome to the English Like a Native podcast, the British English podcast that's designed for lovers of and learners of English. My name is Anna, and today we're learning something surprising. So there we go. I've laid the ground. I've built the suspense. Well, not really, but I've <laughs> I've planted the seed that something surprising is coming. But if you read the title of this podcast, then it will be no surprise. This podcast is actually about the surprising fact that thousands of English words are actually Arabic. Did you know that? I didn't know that. But we know now. I mean, of course, I've always been aware that the English language is a very special mishmash, a special hodgepodge of various influences. All these different languages, different groups of people over the years have come in and added to and taken away from the language, changed the language. And so English is a patchwork of different influences. Now, primarily, English is a Germanic language. And we also have a large amount of vocabulary borrowed from Romance and Latin languages. But it also has borrowed some words from various other languages too, including Arabic. And when I say it's borrowed some words, I mean it's estimated that there are around 3,000 to 4,000 English words that have come from Arabic. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Anna, which words have come from Arabic? Well, let me tell you, many of the English words borrowed from Arabic can be found in areas such as mathematics, science and medicine. And I bet you're now thinking, okay, well, if they're mathematical, scientific and medical words, then they're probably not words that I'll ever use or need to know. But I can tell you with absolute certainty that lots of these words are words that we actually use on a regular basis. In fact, I have a short list in front of me here and many of these words I've said this week already. There you go. Can you hear the rustling of my list? The rustling of the paper. <laughs> I'm rustling my list in my hand. So I'm now going to share this list with you because I'm sure you are desperate to know what is on it. Well, the first word is a word that I had no knowledge of in the first 35 years of my life. Maybe the first 32 or 3 years of my life. But it's something that I hear and say at least once a day today. <laughs> so the word is algorithm. Algorithm. So algorithms are quite prominent in conversation these days because everyone is talking about social media and the internet and how the algorithms manipulate us or how the algorithms serve our needs or do not serve our needs. So an algorithm is a computer term, but it's like a set of instructions that solves a problem. So it's like a computer program that runs and it has a job to do. It has to solve a problem. So for example, one of Google or YouTube's algorithms has to serve you with videos that it thinks you will like based on a set of instructions, based on what you've shown interest in in the past, based on which videos and which creators you like to watch on a regular basis. So then the algorithm will solve the problem of keeping you on the platform. They don't want to lose you, so they try and feed you with videos that you will want to watch. So algorithm, algorithm. Do you love or do you hate the algorithm? People tend to have very strong feelings about the algorithms. If you're a creator and everything is going well, you're getting lots of views, then you love the algorithm. You think the algorithm is your friend. 
And if you work really hard but see no results on social media, then you think the algorithm must hate you, that the algorithm is suppressing you. But the truth is the algorithm is just doing its job. It doesn't love or hate anyone. It doesn't have favorites. It just does its job. Okay, so next on my list is the word algebra. Algebra. Okay, so I realize now, saying that out loud, that I probably told a little fib, a little porky pie. I love the word porky pie. (laughs) A porky pie is so interesting, isn't it? The English language is just so weird. So a porky pie, I guess it comes from Cockney rhyming slang because it rhymes with the word lie. I told a lie, a porky pie. But a pork pie is a savoury pie, something we eat, usually meat. I would imagine pork meat from a pig, surrounded by a little bit of jelly and pastry. And so that's a pork pie, but a porky pie is a lie. A porky pie, a lie. I also said the word fib. Fib is more of a childish word that we use for when children are lying. We tell them not to tell fibs. And I guess a fib is quite harmless. If a child tells a very serious lie, then you would perhaps use the word lie. Lie is stronger than fib. But if a child says something like, yes, I brushed my teeth, even though they didn't brush their teeth, then that would be a fib. It's a pretty harmless lie. I mean, not harmless for their oral health, of course. (laughs) If their teeth aren't brushed, then goodness me, the plaque that will build up, the acid in their mouth that won't be neutralized, their enamel will be worn away. Anyway, I don't want to digress too much. So I told a lie. I said that every word was a word that is used in daily conversation. However, the second word that I introduced is the word algebra which is not something used in daily conversation unless you are a mathematics student or a maths teacher. But it is still a word that I think every single English native person will know, the word algebra, because often people talk about the fact that they hated algebra at school and they don't understand why they are taught algebra. I found algebra okay. I mean... I'm dyslexic, so I've really struggled (laughs) when it came to algebra. I'm not very good with numbers or letters, and I mix up the order of things. So algebra was just (laughs) a bit of a nightmare for me, really. But I did enjoy maths, generally. And that makes me think of the fact that in England, in, in British English, we say maths with an S on the end. Maths. Because we like the gymnastics that you have to do with your tongue to get that TH and then the S. Maths. Maths. But in American English, they drop the S and make it a lot easier. They say math. Math. So it's up to you whether you want to go with the the American version or the British English version. But good to know the difference. Okay, so algebra, just in case you didn't pick that up, is a mathematical term that is, well, it's a branch of mathematics where you have formulas that solve certain maths problems. So the formulas are usually A minus B will equal C. That's algebra. I mean, that was very, very basic. (laughs) But there you go, algebra. Were you a lover or a hater of algebra? Next, and this is a word that's regularly used in the UK, is the word Alcohol. Alcohol. Alcohol is a chemical substance that I'm sure you're all familiar with. You find alcohol in wine, beer, spirits, liqueurs. If you enjoy a gin and tonic, then that is alcoholic. There is alcohol in your gin and tonic. Often people like to cook with alcohol. Often people clean with alcohol-based substances. So alcohol is the chemical substance. And um, I think we're getting better in the UK, but we have been known to drink a little bit too much. And it differs across the island as well. 
yeah, I think it depends on where you are as to the level of alcohol that is consumed in your area. But I think that as we get older, as the generations move move on, I don't know the word for it, as we get older, each generation seems to drink less and less, maybe because we're becoming wise to, you know, the importance of a healthy lifestyle and understanding that alcohol is not a feature of a healthy lifestyle. Anyway, what is your favourite tipple? Your favourite tipple is your drink of choice, the thing that you like to drink of an evening. If you're just relaxing, what would you choose to drink? Would it be a nice glass of red wine? Do you like a Chardonnay, a Merlot? Do you like a bit of fizz, champagne, Prosecco? Do you prefer something a little stronger, maybe a scotch on the rocks? If something is on the rocks, as in a drink is served on the rocks, then it's on ice. So if I ask for a scotch on the rocks, I want scotch served on ice. So in a glass with some ice on it, in it, (laughs) on it, in it, on it, in it. Oh, prepositions. So what is your tipple of choice? For me, it depends on the time of year. When we are in the dark months, in the winter, when it's cold, then I'm quite partial to a liqueur. I like a Deserano, which is like a cherry-based liqueur, I think. Or I could have a Bailey's, but it wouldn't be my tipple of choice. I don't really like very creamy foods and liquids. and So Bailey's is a whiskey-based liqueur, but with cream. So a cream and a chocolate and a whiskey. I mean, I like a bit of ice cream, but I don't like cream. If you had pouring cream, like double cream or whipped cream, spray cream, I don't like any of that cream. I do like ice cream, though. That's the only exception. Yeah, so I like a non-creamy liqueur. I like it very sweet. But I also enjoy a gin, a gin and tonic. Now, I'm sounding like I'm someone who drinks a lot. I really don't. In fact, I don't remember... Maybe I had a glass of wine at some point last week, but I'm not a big drinker. Anyway, let's move on from alcohol. Something that alcohol does come hand in hand with, though, is the next word on our list, sugar. Sugar. Now, sugar, (laughs) sugar is the enemy. We all know what sugar is. It's a sweet, like crystalline substance. It's naturally found in fruit. So it's naturally occurring within fruit. We have fruit sugar but it's also added to a lot of processed foods. Obviously, it's in things like chocolates and cakes, but it's also found in in bread and, well, all sorts of things. Anything that's processed often has some form of sugar in it. And sugar, of course, is bad for us. Well, this is such a big debate, isn't it? I don't want to open this can of worms. If you open a can of worms, it means you open a can of trouble, as it were. You are starting a conversation on a topic that could lead to a big debate. So it's something that's already heavily debated and there's lots of discussion about it and with lots of people who have lots of strong opinions about that topic. So if you open that can of worms, then you're kind of opening up the doors for all of that conflict and debate and discussion, which is not always a bad thing. But often when you use the phrase to open a can of worms, it's when that debate and discussion is not welcome. It's not wanted. So I don't want to open up that can of worms right here, right now on this lovely little podcast meeting that we've got going on. I've got a frog in my throat, haven't I? Excuse me for one second. (coughs) Nice musical cough there. I'm just going to have a little drink, if you don't mind. Can you guess what drink that was? No, it wasn't a gin and tonic. I'm not a lush. A lush is a person who drinks too much. That was a big bottle of water that I just took a little sup of. Okay, so, so far we've had algorithm, algebra, alcohol and sugar. The next word on the list is chemistry. Chemistry. (laughs) That's another word that you don't hear often in day-to-day speaking, in day-to-day conversation. But again, it's a word that everyone knows. You study 
chemistry at school. Okay, so this is a branch of science that's concerned with substances and chemicals and things. I wasn't a big fan of chemistry, to be honest. All those long words, difficult to spell words, me with my dyslexia. (laughs) I really struggled with chemistry. But you can say that there's chemistry between two people. So if you see someone that you like and you're talking to them and there's just something between you, there's just like a spark, you both seem to really like each other, then you could say there's chemistry between us. Or an onlooker, someone who's watching you having your conversation might say, oh, look at that. There's quite a lot of chemistry between you two. Look at your body language. You're very open to one another. I think you two like each other in a more romantic way. Okay, so chemistry. The next word is the word zero. Zero, which is the symbol, the number that comes before one. It represents nothing. So if I have one biscuit, I always use the word biscuit. I talk about biscuits all the time. I have a problem. I am sorry. I'm sorry for bringing my biscuit obsession to the world. And if you're trying to abstain from biscuit consumption, then I do apologize. I always talk about biscuits all the time. So let me just finish my little story. Here we go. If I have one biscuit and then I eat the biscuit, then I have zero biscuits. Okay, there we go. I can put the biscuits to bed. I won't mention biscuits again. I promise. Okay, so zero. What I thought while preparing for this podcast, what I thought was interesting was zero is the only number, if we even technically call it a number, is zero technically a number? Sure, it's got to be, unless someone mathematical out there can correct me. Zero is the only number, I believe, that has the letter Z in it. I mean, we have the Z sound in numbers like thousand, but we don't have the Z written in any other number. Should we just check? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Yeah, I think zero is the only one that contains the letter Z. Ah, Now there's another difference between British and American English. In British English, we say Z, like head, Z. But in American English, they say Z, like me, Z. So when I see the horse that is white and covered in black stripes, I say, oh, look, there's a zebra. But if an American sees that horse with black stripes, he says, or she says, hey, look, it's a zebra. So there you go. A very important difference that you just learned there. Okay, so the next word on my list is, it's my little drum roll, magazine, magazine. A magazine is a, well, periodical publication. It's like a newspaper, but it's normally slightly better quality paper. It normally has a gloss, a glossy finish, and it doesn't technically report the news, although there will be kind of cultural news segments in there. So things to do with pop stars or, you know, whatever the theme of the magazine is, because you can get magazines that cover all sorts of topics and niches from fishing to boat life to children's magazines based around particular characters or cartoons that they enjoy. You can get knitting magazines and wildlife magazines, photography magazines, and then you have the kind of popular culture magazines, so celebrity magazines and beauty magazines. I mean, there's a magazine probably for every possible, like, interest set. And I'm sure the magazine industry is still doing very well. 
despite the internet, I'm sure people still enjoy having a magazine in their hand, just like I'm sure that, you know, the book industry is still doing well, despite digital books being quite popular these days. So magazines, when I was a child, I used to collect magazines. I had a subscription for the World Wildlife Foundation magazine because I was obsessed with animals. I wanted to save all the animals and I would spend my time learning about different types of animals and knowing all the facts about animals. And uh, (laughs) I had my own little animal sanctuary in my house. I used to always bring home little baby birds that had fallen out of their nest and half-eaten mice that I'd rescued from the jaws of a cat and things like that. And I would try and nurse them back to health. Some of them wouldn't make it because they just died of shock. Maybe shock of this giant child taking them out of their, you know, environment. But half the time, I think they were just too, too sick to be saved. Anyway, back to magazines. I collected these wildlife magazines and yeah, I had a subscription. So you pay a subscription fee and then the magazines can be delivered to your home every time they're released on a weekly or monthly basis. Or you can go down to your corner shop, which is like your local little shop that isn't always on a corner, but we often call it a corner shop, which is technically a news agent. If they sell magazines and newspapers, then it would likely be a news agent. So you go to the news agents and you pick up your magazine, and then you take it home and you sit and you you thumb through all the pages to thumb through is to go from page to page to page. So yeah, I enjoyed my wildlife magazine and I've tried to get my children into reading magazines. They're still a bit young because they don't actually read yet, but they do enjoy the Peppa Pig magazines and the Hey Dougie magazines and the Number Blocks magazines. I like getting those ones because it feels more educational when they're learning about numbers and counting and things. So the next word on the list is a very common piece of furniture. That's not the word. I want you to guess the word. It's a very common piece of furniture that most people have in their home, regardless of how big their home is. Almost everyone will have one of these in their living room, which we sometimes also call a front room or lounge. And it's something that we sit on. And it's a a sociable piece of furniture. Many people will sit on this one thing together. What am I referring to? A sofa. So some people will call this a couch or a settee and other people will call it a sofa. But a sofa is the long chair, comfy, soft chair that you lounge on, you sit on in the front room of your house. We often sit on our settee to watch TV. Sit on our settee to watch TV. But I should have said sit on our sofa to watch TV. Our sofa is actually a corner sofa. So there's a long section which can take three butts. (laughs) Three bottoms can sit on the long section. And then the end of that is a corner. and, And it juts out like an L shape. And you can add an extra bottom on the bit that juts out. So that's four bottoms. And actually, if you all squeeze up together, you could probably get a good five or six people on our L-shaped sofa, our corner sofa. The problem with our sofa is we have two young children who like to jump around a lot. And so we have areas that are kind of sinking in a little where the children jump a bit too much. They also sit and eat sometimes on our sofa. And so I often find things like Cheerios or raisins discarded in the folds of the material or down the back of the sofa. When Jacob, my eldest son, was younger, he went through a phase of posting things It could be anything into any hole. He would just post it. So (laughs) I did provide him with lots of posting style tools and toys. 
you know, I would cut holes into shoe boxes and give him things to post through that hole. And I bought him a little post box even with some little wooden letters to post into his wooden post box. And I gave him a money box with lots of pennies that he would slot the pennies into the money box. He'd enjoy that. But he still enjoyed just taking random things and posting them wherever he could. What's the point of this story, Anna? Well, (laughs) the point is he took a handful of cars one day and decided to start posting them into the fold of the sofa. So into the kind of, you know, the area where one cushion stops and another cushion starts. But the way our sofa works is uh, we have a mechanism which brings up a footrest automatically. So you can press a button and the footrest will zzzz come up and the sofa all moves. This is only on one seat of the sofa. But it means that there's like a mechanical element to our sofa. And so we don't have cushions that you can take off the sofa. Instead, there's just a void that goes into the mechanisms, into the mechanics of our sofa. And we had bought Jacob, I think, a pack of like 16 or 20 Hot Wheel cars. And he really loved these cars. And they're not cheap, these little Hot Wheel cars. And we bought them for him. And then one day we realised that we only had five of these cars. Well, where are the others? So we bought some more because he really enjoyed these cars and we wanted him to have lots of them. So we bought more. And eventually we must have had about 50 Hot Wheel cars. But again, when we would tidy up, we could only find a handful of them. Where are these cars? Jacob had discovered that he could just post these cars into our sofa and they disappeared and that was really good fun and so I had to distort my arm I had to what's the word I had to become a contortionist I had to contort not distort contort is the word I wanted I had to contort my arm and my body into the back of this sofa trying to rescue and bring back all of these cars I didn't find all of them and then a handful of them he'd actually posted into our speaker so we have a big speaker for the television and he'd found that you know the bit that moves (laughs) there's a hole no not the bit that moves the bit on the back I'm not very good with speakers I'm not very technical you've got the bit that booms where the sound comes out but there was a section at the back with a big hole and he just started posting his cars into the speaker And so it wasn't until one day we moved the speaker and we heard this rattling. And we thought, what on earth is that noise? What's inside this speaker? Something is loose inside the speaker. And we realised what happened. Anyway, we still haven't retrieved all of the Hot Wheel cars, but at least Jacob has stopped posting things now. So that's my sofa story. Let's move on to the next thing on the list. Cotton. Cotton is the next thing on the list. This is basically a material. It's like a soft, white material. Well, cotton, it grows in fields, doesn't it? But we use it to make cloth. I have a cotton sheet on my bed. I would love to have a silk sheet because silk is so good for your skin. However, silk is very expensive and I cannot afford, unless I sold my house, I couldn't afford to buy full silk bedding for my bed because it's so expensive. I mean, it's not that expensive, but it is far too expensive for me to have silk bedding. When I turned 40, I treated myself to silk pillowcases and it is such a luxury. If I ever go anywhere, I always try and take my own pillow or at least my own pillowcase because the difference between silk and cotton, you really notice once you've slept with your face against silk, you really notice how dry cotton can make your skin feel. But otherwise, I love a bit of cotton. Nice, breathable, fresh cotton. Nice cotton sheets, cotton bedding. Okay, next we have jar. A jar. It always makes me think of jam when I say the word jar. You have a jam jar. But often you have jars full of all sorts of things besides jam. 
marmalade <laughs> or pasta sauce or sun-dried tomatoes, pickled onions, peanut butter would come in a jar. All sorts of things come in jars. I don't know if you're like me, but in the top shelf of our fridge, we have lots of jars that have probably been there for as long as we've been in this house, so maybe four years, and you forget what's in there. You kind of have these jars of things that don't go off very quickly. So like olives, for example, you can keep them in the fridge in their jar for quite a long time. But I think we probably leave them in the fridge for too long. And so the top shelf is just barely visited. It's very crowded with lots of jars, but barely visited. Okay, the next one on my list is lemon. Lemon is a lovely citrus fruit. I don't really know what to say about lemon. I went through a phase of drinking lemon water. I don't know why I stopped. I think maybe I was concerned about the acidity of the lemon water and how that was affecting my teeth because I'm always concerned about my thinning enamel on my teeth. So perhaps that's why I stopped. But having a glass of water in the morning before anything else is probably a good thing that I should continue to do rather than smashing down a coffee the moment I wake up. So the next word on my list is a move that's used in chess to win the game. It's something you'd shout out at the end when you have your opponent in a compromised position. They can't do anything when you shout this, when you get into this position. And it is checkmate, checkmate. So it's a move that means that you've restricted your opponent and it basically means that you win. Checkmate, checkmate. Okay, the next one is the word for a mobile home. And uh, people curse when they see one of these on the road. It is a caravan. A caravan. Now, caravan can be used, as I've just used it, to describe a mobile home. Something that you hitch onto the back of your car, you then tow it very carefully along the road, being sworn at by lots of drivers who are just desperate to get past you because you're driving so slowly while you're towing this caravan. And then you get to the holiday park or wherever you're going to pitch your caravan and you hook it up to the electricity or the water or whatever it is that it does because some caravans are very fancy and you can hook up the electric and the water and have showers in them and everything whereas other caravans are quite basic and you need to have a gas bottle in there for your cooker and maybe you have a big tank of water in the caravan but you don't hook them up to anything. Anyway, that would be a caravan, but a caravan can also refer to a group of people who are traveling together. Okay, next on my list is something that I use most days. It's a cosmetic product that's used to make your eyelashes appear longer, fuller, or of course darker. It is mascara. Mascara. Often people applying mascara will open their mouths very wide <laughs> while applying mascara. I don't know what that's all about. It's like you're trying to open your eye wide and the messages from your brain get a bit confused and they tell your eyes and your mouth to open wide at the same time. <laughs> Anybody else do that? <laughs> I do. Anyway, mascara. <laughs> Uh, the next on the list is a way of describing a deep red colour. And I love this word. It's the word crimson. Crimson. This isn't really a commonly used word, but crimson is a lovely colour. And you might hear this word more around the Christmas season because we often have a lot of deep red decorations at Christmas time. A crimson tablecloth, for example, or if someone's talking about wine, they might talk about the crimson colour of the wine. OK, the last three words on the list, I'm going to whiz through these as quickly as I can. Well, not as quickly as I can. I could go faster. But the first one is admiral. 
admiral, which is the commander of a fleet of ships, an admiral. The next one is bazaar, a bazaar, which is a marketplace or a shop. We don't really have bazaars here in this country. When I was in Istanbul, I went to the Grand Bazaar. I did that a few times, actually, and bought myself one of those beautiful kind of lamps with the big colourful globe, glass globe that hangs from this lamp. Oh, it's beautiful. I actually bought two. Um, they're different colours. One's more blue and one has like a green and pink colour. And I got those from the Grand Bazaar. And the last one on the list is, and I love this word, I saved this one to last, is elixir. An elixir. Oh, no. Oh, no. Shh. Alexa. Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. See, that word sounds very close to the name of my Amazon Echo device. Alexa. So I will not say the word elixir again <laughs> because she might start talking to me. Okay, so an elixir is a potion or medicine that can cure like your ailments, your ills. So I think if someone talks about an elixir, then I think it's more of like a potion, something that's been concocted by someone who maybe isn't a trained medical professional, but someone who thinks they can use like oils and random bits and bobs to cure a problem. That's how I think of an elixir, something that I wouldn't necessarily trust as being scientifically proven to work. But it's a lovely word, isn't it? As long as it doesn't trigger your Amazon Echo <laughs> device, your Amazon Echo Dot or whatever it's called. Okay, so there we go. There's my list. We had algorithm, algebra, alcohol, sugar, chemistry, zero, magazine, sofa, cotton, jar, lemon, checkmate, caravan, mascara, crimson, admiral, bazaar, and Alexa. Oh, she just lit up. And she's just turned herself down. That's helpful. Okay, so these examples are just a small sample of the many words in English that are borrowed from Arabic. So it's quite clear that the influence of Arabic on the English language is actually quite significant. And I just thought that was brilliant. I'm really glad that I've learned that now. And if you are someone who is learning or already knows Arabic then this is exciting because there are lots of words that will already be quite familiar to you. So yay! Woohoo! Fantastic! Okay, so if you are an English Like a Native Plus member, I'm now going to record a little podcast about the difference between borrow and lend. And I'm going to wax lyrical about those differences which is going to be quite useful because there'll be some commonly used phrases that you should know. So if you want to know more about becoming an English Like a Native Plus member, then the description is the place to go. <laughs> Otherwise, I am really grateful that you stuck with me through however long this, how long, how long have we been here? Let me have a look. Hang on. Click, click, click. <gasps> Well, <clears throat> that's 40 minutes of your life that you won't get back. I do hope it was useful. So thank you so much. Again, thank you. I really do appreciate you being here. Perhaps if you would be so kind, you could leave a little rating or a review or something or a like wherever you are. That would be really useful because these engagements just help to let me know that you know, you guys love what I do. Well, love is probably a bit of a strong word, that you like what I do and you want me to do more. So I'd really appreciate that interaction because it's so hard. It's so hard with a podcast. I don't know what's going on at the other side. Are you even awake? You might be snoring right now. I might have bored you. I might have bored you to death with, with my rambling. Hopefully not. Okay, thank you. Take care and goodbye.